Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for joining us today. Sorry, we're getting started a little late. DC traffic has a way of delaying all sorts of things. Um, but we're delighted to have you with us today. This is our fifth annual Cato Summit on Financial Regulation. Uh, usually, we're gallivanting around the US with this conference. We take it to different financial centers throughout uh, the United States. But we decided that this year, the theme, financial inclusion, was really a message for this town. And uh, so we will be talking about how innovation is helping to bring more people into the financial system and how it's improving their lives, but also how regulatory modernization can help in that endeavor. So this also marks the first in our new initiative for financial inclusion here at the Cato Institute, a program to educate policymakers and the public about technologies and regulatory change that can help our financial system serve the underserved. We are really excited about it, and today you'll get to hear from the, uh, the initiative's co-leads, both Todd Zwicky and Diego Zuluaga, uh, and they will be on our program later today. So on uh, financial regulation, um, I think it's important that we start with a definition of financial inclusion. What is financial inclusion? So we are, uh, financial inclusion is about people having access to deposit, savings, investment opportunities, and a payment system that helps them to do the things in their life that uh, they want to do. Individuals have different uh, choices and different things that they are hoping to accomplish. And so we want to make sure our regulatory system is able to accomplish that. So we are here today to talk about how regulation can also be modernized to help ensure that financial inclusion is not just an afterthought. A lot of times regulation uh, has a lot of responsibilities. We expect it to do things to help us with safety and soundness. And, uh, and, and it has goals that sometimes Financial inclusion is an afterthought, and it sometimes ends up being an unintended consequence that we actually end up with financial exclusion. And so with that definition in mind, um, I'm really delighted to uh, welcome, you, welcome our morning keynote. Uh, opening up our conference today is uh, uh, Chairman Yelena McWilliams, who is the 21st chairman of the FDIC and also the fourth woman to serve as uh, chairman. Uh, we're delighted to have her with us today. She has uh, served in various capacities, both in the private sector, but especially in the, pu in the um, public service at the Fed and in the US Senate. And, but she also has a really compelling personal story about how financial inclusion helped her achieve her American dream, and I hope she'll be talking a little bit about that today as we start our conference. Thank you all so much for coming today. Um, please join me in welcoming Yelena. Good morning, everybody. Can you hear me okay? The, um, it is an honor to speak here today. I have spent a considerable amount of time in my first year as chairman uh, thinking about this issue, thinking about the unbanked, underbanked, financial inclusion and technology in the United States, and how, what can we do to utilize technology to bring more of the unbanked and underbanked into the uh, financial fold, but also what does financial inclusion mean? And um, yes, I do talk about a little bit about my personal story. Uh, at this point, it almost has not become an option not to talk about my personal story uh, at an event uh, entitled Economic Inclusion. Um, actually, today marks my uh, 53rd week at the FDIC, but who's counting? Uh, and uh, I'm, I'm thrilled to be here to um, have this opportunity to talk to you about my thoughts and, and my approach to these issues. Uh, the mission of the FDIC, and in particular, our goal to expand economic inclusion, is one that resonates with me on a personal level very profoundly. I spent my 18th birthday uh, on a plane en route to the United States, with $500 in my pocket and a dream that I could make it here. I understand from personal experience how important it is uh, to have a safe and sound financial system that is accessible to people from all walks of life. And what I have learned since through my various personal and professional experiences is that the banking system can help make the American dream a reality for millions of Americans. Many things have changed in those 28 years since I arrived on my maiden voyage. Within six months of my arrival, the airline disappeared, Pan Am, as did my former homeland, Yugoslavia. Internet became widely available and technology changed how we do just about everything and especially how consumers approach commerce and banking. 
Technology is not simply transforming how consumers access financial services, it is transforming the business of banking as we know it, both in the way consumers interact with their financial institutions and the way banks do business of banking. While new technology can cer certainly introduce risk, it can also help regulators and institutions un identify and mitigate risk sooner. And it will undoubtedly present opportunities to ease the burden of regulatory compliance while reaching more co consumers. Technology allows financial institutions to meet consumers where they are, and it offers a tremendous opportunity to expand access to the banking system. From ATMs to credit cards to digital, digital banking channels, innovation has made financial products and services more available, affordable, and convenient. A key question for the regulators is then, are we going to help build this brand new world, or are we going to stand in its way? Innovation in financial services is not new. Banking has been the product of continuous innovation going to ba back to the time when the De Medici brothers and their contemporaries improved the general ledger system through the development of the double entry system for credits and debts, what we today call deposits and withdrawals. It is fair to say that innovation in banking has been around at least since the 15th century. What is different today is the speed at which innovation happens, the impact of technological innovation in and on banking, and the potential for technology to disrupt not just an institution or two, but banking as we know it. For most part, regulators are trying to fit those new developments into last century's regulatory regime. In other words, regulators have tinkered around the edges of innovation without fundamentally changing the way we look at our regulatory framework and innovation. Does it matter? Does it matter if the regulators and the regulatory framework support innovation? After all, the job of a regulatory agency is to regulate, plain and simple. As I think about regulatory framework and innovation, there are three broad categories. One, a regulatory framework that hinders innovation. Two, a regulatory framework that is neutral to innovation. And three, a framework that encourages innovation. At best, our current financial regulatory framework falls, falls into that second category, neutrality. In many cases, it actually hinders innovation by making banks reluctant to innovate and develop products. And I will talk about this in a second. This should come as no surprise. By their very nature, bank regulators are risk averse and more skeptical than accepting of change. Also by their very nature, banks are reluctant to go on a limb and innovate unless they know with certainty that their regulators will look favorably upon innovation. While no regulatory framework is capable of foreseeing all possible future circumstances it may want to address, it is paramount that regulation not hinder innovation for two crucial reasons. One, technology is a great equalizer. The banking industry has a history of innovating to meet consumers' needs. Technological innovation gives banks an opportunity to reach broad audiences swiftly, offer new products and services efficiently, and it promotes competition. Banks that do not benefit from the economies of scale can utilize technology to more effectively compete with both their larger counterparts and competitors located in different geographies. In a free market economy, competition is a good thing and consumers benefit from it. Two, new technology has proven able to improve the customer experience, lower transaction costs, and increase credit availability. It also offers a tremendous opportunity to expand access to the banking system. Technological innovation can make banking services accessible to people who are either not part of the banking system or disenfranchised. They might have had a banking relationship that did not work out for them and now have one or no banking relationships. According to the 2017 FDIC National Survey of Unbanked and Underbanked Households, more than 8 in 10 underbanked households and nearly half of unbanked households had access to a smartphone in 2017. In addition, nearly one-third of unbanked households and 76% of underbanked households report having internet access at home. The proportion of bank households that use mobile banking to access their accounts increased from 23.2% in 2013 to 40.4% in 2017. The share of banked households using online methods incre increased to 63% over the same period. Those numbers show that if you build it, they will come. As a matter of public policy, we should encourage banks to leverage technology to reach consumers, improve the customer experience, lower transaction costs, and increase credit availability. There is certainly an opportunity to to utilize technology and innovation to both expand the availability of banking services 
to those who are already banked and to reach customers who are not. Bringing consumers, particularly those that are dis dis disenfranch disenfranchised with our banking system into the banking fold gives those consumers an opportunity to become a part of the system and to benefit from its many offerings. Why should we want consumers to be banked? It's a fair question. After all, many of those who no longer have a banking relationship got burnt by their banks, by overdraft fees on a checking account or late fees on a credit card. Those skeptical of the benefits banks provide should ponder a different question. What is an alternative? And I will oblige you with a personal story. I cannot help but highlight my personal story to juxtapose my experience in the land I chose to call home, the United States of America, to that of the land that I was born in. As I was growing up in the Socialist Republic of Yugoslavia, it did not take me long to recognize democracy was limited, policy was made behind closed doors, and large corporations were owned by the state. Now you don't blame me for choosing this country. When the former Yugoslavia and its financial system collapsed in the early 1990s, my then 68-year-old father went to work as a day laborer for $5 a day. My mother was a seamstress and a cafeteria serv server in a government-owned construction company. To say that we lived humbly would be an understatement. And yet, my father did not believe in having debt, so all purchases had to be made in cash. We would only buy a new piece of furniture or a new TV if we had enough cash saved to do so. On those rare occasions when my parents needed to borrow money, they did not go to a bank. Not because they could not find one or because they mistrusted banks. On the contrary, banks were aplenty, all state-owned, and my parents did not mistrust banks. However, bank credit was either hard to get or prohibitively expensive. So my parents would borrow money from a friend or a family member as they did to send me to America. People who had money to lend lived in constant fear of break-ins and home invasions. I recall walking into a friend's apartment and this family had not two, but four deadbolt locks. And I thought they must be rich. In the United States, banks ameliorate the need for people to hide their money in a mattress, and the FDIC guarantees deposits up to $250,000 per insured depositor. If consumers know how to manage credit responsibly, they can utilize credit to build household wealth over time and improve their living standards. Banks afford consumers many important benefits that go beyond individual customers. They contribute to the system by helping fund a town's, a town's grocery store, barbershops, restaurants, and other small businesses. In rural communities and urban neighborhoods, banks provide a critical lifeline for low and moderate income customers. Banks and the communities they serve are, are intrinsically intertwined in a symbiotic relationship. The better those communities do, the better banks fare. Still, millions of US households do not experience these benefits because they're unbanked or underbanked. This number is trending down, but the FDIC's 2017 survey shows that more than 8 million households do not have any relationship with the banking system. Another 24.2 million households are underbanked, meaning they have a bank account, but also meet some of their financial services needs outside of the banking system. Unbanked and underbanked rates are higher among lower income households that are less educated, younger, black and Hispanic, working age disabled, and those with volatile incomes. With the potential for so, uh, for so much change, the FDIC is obligated to fully understand emerging technology and its implica implications. We owe this duty to both our banks, their customers, and their future customers. We have already begun partnering with banks to understand how they are innovating. We are working to identify and hire subject matter experts to deepen our understanding of technological advancements. Adapting to advancement in banking technology is nothing new for the FDIC. It is new how fast we have to do it this time around. Too often regulatory agencies play catch up with technological advances and their impact on regulated entities and consumers. The goal of our work at the FDIC is to re reverse that trend through increased collaboration and partnership with the industry. We will move forward together and help increase the velocity of transformation while ensuring that banks are safe and sound and consumers sufficiently protected. As we ramp up to meet these new challenges, we have to keep in sight the potential benefits. Chief among them is that innovation can introduce reliable products and services that will bring more Americans into the banking system. 
It is my goal that the FDIC, under my chairmanship, lay the foundation for this next chapter of banking, encourage innovation that meets consumer demand, promote community banking, and reduce compliance burdens. The role of a regulatory agency is not to stand in the way of relationship between banks and, the, and customers, but to encourage them. To this end, the FDIC is undertaking a number of initiatives to engage with bankers, consumers, and communities to revisit our regulations to find ways to streamline and simplify compliance requirements and to encourage efforts by banks to meet consumers' needs. I will briefly touch upon a few of those initiatives before I close. Recent studies by the Federal Reserve show that nearly four in 10 households cannot cover a $400 emergency expense with cash. As someone who once lived paycheck to paycheck, I'm acutely aware that sometimes consumers need immediate access to cash to cover unexpected costs, such as a broken vehicle, to take them to their jobs. Generally, consumers benefit when they can walk into a bank to obtain this type of credit, especially banks that have long-standing relationships with local customers and communities. But banks at times have chosen not to offer such products due to the regulatory environment in which they operate. As a result, many families rely on non-bank providers to cover these emergency expenses or their needs go unmet. If banks do not offer small dollar products, consumers who need small dollar loans do not even have an opportunity to become banked and start building their credit histories. It is that simple. The FDIC is looking for ways to encourage banks to meet those needs in a manner that makes sense for both the bank and the consumer. In November, we issued a request for information on small dollar credit products. We asked questions on a range of topics, including seeking insights on what legal and regulatory impediments exist that prevent or disincentivize banks from offering small dollar credit. We gathered a lot of valuable information through this process, and we're using this feedback, feedback to formulate a revised policy framework to encourage banks to offer small dollar loan products to customers in need. The bottom line is that we are not going to encourage unbanked and underbanked to become a part of the banking system if we are unwilling to consider what products may appeal to them and then create a regulatory environment that allows banks to offer those products. Banks, on the other hand, are not going to offer products if they're unable to make money while being exposed to regulatory, legal, and reputational liability. To bridge that divide, the regulators have to think outside of the box to allow banks to innovate without fear of uncertainty or regulatory whims. Our regulatory system has been far too complicated, especially for the nation's community banks, which are not all that complicated. If we want banks to focus on innovation and reaching more consumers, we have to relieve some of the unnecessary regulatory burden on those institutions so they can get back to the business of banking. As banks develop strategies to bring more consumers into the banking system, non-banks are introducing innovative new products and services to meet consumer demands. Marketplace lending and crowdfunding platforms offer credit and funding without banks' involvement. Peer-to-peer -peer payment technology allows cu customers to transfer funds easily via the internet or a phone. Banks have to compete, not only with other banks, but also with these companies and other technology companies that are able to reach consumers and offer financial products with more agility and less burdensome regulation. To ensure that we are prepared to address the changing landscape in financial services, the FDIC has dedicated significant resources to identify and understand emerging technology. We're examining trends in retail financial markets, including marketplace and digital lending, machine learning and artificial intelligence, and big data. We're also considering developments in the wholesale financial markets, as well as blockchain and distributed ledger technology. And we're looking at regulatory burden imposed on banks and asking how much of it is necessary. The FDIC has taken a number of actions over the past year to ensure that we are appropriately addressing risks to the banking system without imposing unnecessary regulatory burdens. For example, we're working to substantially simplify the capital requirements for small banks by giving qualifying community banks the option to calculate a simple leverage ratio rather than the multiple risk-based capital and leverage ratios imposed on them by the Basel framework. We're also working to tailor the risk-based capital rules for banks that do not qualify for the community ba bank leverage ratio, recognizing that the risk-based regime should be simpler. We have issued proposals to tailor capital, liquidity, and resolution planning requirements for regional banks so that the requirements better align with the size and risk profile of each institution 
without undermining, undermining safety and soundness or our resolution capabilities. We expect to finalize a rulemaking to exempt community banks from the VOCA rule this month. At the same time, we have been hard at work simplifying and rationalizing the VOCA rule more broadly. We hope to be able to finalize changes to the rule's proprietary trading restrictions sometime this summer. Another priority of mine is to ensure that the supervisory guidance we provide is as clear and concise as possible. Last year, the FDIC rescinded nearly 60% of our supervisory financial institution letters after determining that they were outdated or redundant. The purpose of all of these steps is to provide consistency, clarity, and common sense regulation and supervision that will enable financial institutions to serve their customers while ensuring that the, that the financial system remains strong and resilient. Another initiative is to encourage the formation of new banks. A key feature of any competitive industry is the ability for new startups to enter the marketplace. In the banking industry, de novo banks are a key source of capital, talent, ideas, and ways to serve customers. They bring innovation and new energy to the industry. Since the financial crisis, the Nova activity has screeched to a halt. Only two new startups opened between the end of 2010 and the end of 2016. More recently, we have seen signs of increased interest in new bank formation, and the FDIC is taking a number of steps to encourage this interest. In, Dece in December, we rolled out an improved application process to offer prospective organizers the opportunity to submit draft insurance proposals and receive feedback from the FDIC in advance of a formal filing. We published a handbook for the de novo organizers that walks them through each stage of the application process. And we published, for the first time, our own internal processes for reviewing deposit insurance applications. Finally, we launched a nationwide outreach initiative focusing on de novo bank formation, beginning with a roundtable discussion in DC in December and sub subsequent roundtable discussions in each of our six regional offices, which have been constructive and thoughtful. Ultimately, our regulatory regime should encourage startups and innovation. Our ultimate goal is to develop a pipeline of new banks that can offer new business models, banking services and products, as well as fill gaps in overlooked markets and those that have been traditionally underserved. When we talk about economic inclusion, it is easy to lose perspective of what it is. It is not an amorphous concept. People who have banking products are able to build good credit histories. People who build good credit histories are able to qualify to buy a house. With home ownership comes a sense of attachment, literally and figuratively, to the street, neighborhood, broader community, public school system, local parks and libraries, municipal infrastructure. People who belong are by very definition not disenfranchised. And people who are not disenfranchised are invested in their communities. They want their communities to succeed. Put simply, economic inclusion leads to economic prosperity. I know because I was on both sides of that proverbial fence. And let me tell you, the, gra the grass is in fact much greener on this side. The day after I arrived in the United States, I opened a checking account at a bank and deposited all of my money five crisp $100 bills in that account. I would like to say that the 18-year-old me possessed the wisdom to know that the simple act of opening a checking account would have a significant impact on my life. I did not. What I did know was that opening the checking account was necessary for me to function in my new homeland. It did not take long for me to realize that in addition to a checking account, I should have a credit card. I applied for a credit card, but with no credit history, and no assets other than the meager $500, I was denied. I felt destitute and only years later came to realize that people like me have a cool acronym, NINJA. No income, no job or assets. There's nothing cool about being <coughs> that type of NINJA, let me tell you. Nonetheless, I was offered the option to open a secured credit card and I jumped on it. If you really think, think about it, the entire concept did not make sense. I was essentially borrowing from myself while the bank held my money as collateral and collected the interest. I actually could not even explain the concept back to my father in Yugoslavia. But with each swipe of that credit card, I felt more integrated into the very fiber of American society. I no longer had to count cash in my hand and add price of food items in my head before I would reach the cashier. 
I no longer had to tell the gas attendant to pump only five or $10 worth of gas into my car. After 12 on-time monthly payments, the bank released my security deposit. With my newly established credit history, I was able to obtain an unsecured credit card and a world of opportunities opened up. And yes, sometimes I had a late penalty fee as well. From there, I built my credit history and qualified for an auto loan, student loans, and eventually a mortgage for my first home. In fact, two mortgages. The home was in California. With that credit history, I became a part of the United States financial system. That very system enabled me to get a college degree and a law degree, to become a homeowner, to provide food and shelter for my elderly parents and a young daughter as a single mom, and eventually to stand before you today as the 21st chairman of the FDIC. That secured credit card in 1991 on terms that I would probably find egregious now was my ticket into the system that has subsequently allowed me to thrive. And as I thrived within the system, I learned to respect and to contribute to it. As I became a taxpayer, a homeowner, a mother of a child in public schools, and a public servant in various roles at the Federal Reserve, the United States Senate, and now the FDIC, I became a shareholder in the United States of America with a vested interest in its success. I do not mean to downplay my role in getting to where I am today. Trust me when I tell you that it took an extraordinary amount of grit, sacrifice, and perseverance to go from $500 to the FDIC chairmanship. But I firmly believe that I could not have done it anywhere else in the world, and I certainly could not have done it had I not become a part of the system here. As the old adage goes, only in America. Because of my respect for and gratitude to America, I take my jobs seriously. My job as a regulator is to ensure that our regulatory system encourages innovation so that our financial markets are resilient and our consumers are adequately protected. My job as a taxpayer is to be a responsible citizen. My job as an American is to ensure that the system built on free enterprise, market economy, and entrepreneurship continues to thrive into the 21st century. I assure you the FDIC will keep an open mind to the potential challenges and opportunities presented by innovation and financial inclusion. Our regulatory framework should work for both a millennial who has never stepped foot inside a bank branch and a young immigrant who cannot afford a smartphone. Both that millennial and the young immigrant will benefit in the long run from being a part of our banking system and the FDIC stands ready to make that happen. Thank you. I think I can, can take questions? Do you want to go